Hello and welcome to our webinar, New Vehicle Technology for Safe and Healthy Mobility, brought to you by Global Fleet Champions. Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Brick, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the campaign and what we do, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. During today's webinar, sponsored by Mixed Telematics, we will discuss the latest vehicle technology being developed and tested across the world, how vehicle technology can help organisations reduce road risk, and what fleet managers should be doing now to prepare, to prepare for the future. On your screen now, you should be able to see a multiple choice question poll, so we can find out your views. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press confirm, and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which is your opportunity to ask some of today's presenters a question. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. Thank you for your time and the webinar will now begin. Hello, my name is Rob Capaldi. I'm the Commercial Manager for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles at Hariba Myra. I'm going to give a talk on the future of automotive safety with particular attention being paid to Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, ADAS, and Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, CAV. The presentation is going to run through a few key questions, answering firstly, who are we and why are we here talking to you? What's happening in the automotive market at the moment in terms of ADAS and automated driving? What systems are currently available on vehicles and what will the future look like? So firstly, to answer the question, who are we? We are Hariva Myra, a global leader in engineering, research and product testing for automotive research and development. We're a leading engineering service provider for many vehicle makers, system providers, and tier ones. We have three key elements to our business. Firstly, engineering consultancy, providing expertise to develop new vehicle concepts through to complex problem resolution and developments of advanced vehicle technologies, such as automation systems and advanced driver assistance systems. We provide test engineering services. These can range from single component tests through to full vehicle validation programs, with a high focus being put on vehicle safety, including having a full Euro NCAP crash laboratory with pedestrian impact center and high G sled. Finally, we have a technology park that we welcome many high-tech R&D companies to use. This allows them to access our test facilities and our engineering expertise, forming a globally recognized hub for automotive research and development. This shows that our company is very well positioned to comment on the future of the automotive market and where things are developing. So I'm going to speak specifically about where CAV and ADAS sit in the automotive industry, what developments are taking place and how the industry is moving with these changes. At the moment we can say that we're going through the third revolution of the automotive sector. The automotive industry went its, through its first revolution with the development of assembly line manufacture, moving from hand-built one-off vehicles to efficient mass production of products for a consumer market. We're currently seeing the second great revolution with the increase in adoption of new fuel types to reduce the use of fossil fuels and reduce the harmful emissions seen from internal combustion engine vehicles. In the future, we expect to see a significant shift not only in the technologies fitted to vehicles, but also how these vehicles are used, with highly automated vehicles being developed with a focus on completely new use cases, with ride sharing and mobility as a service being seen as key future uses. This is a big shift away from private ownership of vehicles, but will bring huge efficiency benefits and benefits to society. We can say that the industry is being shaped by a number of key mega trends, summarized by the fact that in the future we expect mobility to be connected, autonomous, shared, and electrified. This move will bring significant safety, health, and cost benefits for consumers and vehicle users. This isn't just theory. Governments around the world are investing and are making developments in this field to a very large extent. The US government is actively engaging in the preparation for an automated future. The Department of Transport have published many papers and guidance notes to help shape the way these technologies are being trialed and used on US roads. The UK government has established the department, the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, with a specific brief to establish the UK as a leading global location for the development of CAV technologies. They'll develop an inclusive regulatory framework for the trial and development of CAVs. 
They'll fund innovative research into CAV technologies and are developing Testbed UK through an organization called Zenzik, a range of test facilities to allow trial of many CAV test use cases for the early stages of development to ensure they operate consistently, and most importantly, safely before moving on to full deployments on the public road. The Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, the industry body representing the automotive industry, have made the very bold statement that by 2030, it's expected that one in every five miles travels could be automated. This figure was published as part of their report into the future of connected vehicles published just this year. This report included a number of key statistics that make a compelling case for the development of cab technologies, bringing major economic and user benefits, including huge levels of economic growth with increased spending in this sector, and a number of highly skilled jobs being created in automotive and in broader industries. And perhaps most importantly, an improvement in safety to a very large extent, with a drastic reduction in the number of crashes seen on the public roads, and a number of lives being saved by the point of 2030. So what do we mean when we refer to CAV and ADAS? This diagram illustrates this quite well. The Society of Automotive Engineers have published a useful guide to the level of automation in vehicles on a scale from zero to five. Zero represents a vehicle with very limited assistance, typically limited to just warning the driver of potential problems on the road with no control of the vehicle being taken away from the driver. Levels one and two include features that are now very commonplace on production vehicles, such as automatic emergency braking, lane keep assist, and adaptive cruise control, and some of the emerging technologies such as park assist and highway autopilot. These systems allow the vehicle to have a limited amount of control, but the human driver is always fully able to regain control at any one point, having their hands and feet on the controls at any time. When we reach level three, this becomes the switchover points, in which the car takes full control of driving with no need to have feet or hands on the steering wheel or controls. But the vehicle will always be able to hand back control to the driver if a situation presents itself that it's not able to handle. This is quite a tricky point to take this handover of control from the vehicle back to the driver. When we reach level four and five, these provide much higher levels of automation without the option to even hand control back to the driver. These will be vehicles without steering wheels and pedals to be controlled. We're starting to see emerge in some mixed use cases in controlled environments around the world. To summarize these levels, we can say that levels zero, one, and two are assistance, ADAS features. Levels three, four, and five are automation features. So how are the automotive industry dealing with these new emerging technologies? And how are they developing the way that these technologies are going to work on their vehicles? There's a roadmap that has been published that spells out how these different features are going to be developed over the coming years, starting with where we are now with existing systems being used on vehicles, things like AEB, LKA, and ACC, as already mentioned. Also blind spot warning, lane departure warning. These features will be combined together to start to provide high levels of automation in some of the features that you can see on screen now, things like traffic jam assist, park assist, and highway pilots. These features are in development now and are typically combinations of many lower levels of ADAS features coming together to provide automation. These will eventually come together into highly automated vehicles that will be deployable by around 2030. So I'll briefly talk through some of these features that are currently available on the market, explaining some of their benefits, explaining how they operate. Firstly, automatic emergency braking. This is a safety system that typically includes two major functions, one called forward collision warning and the second automatic emergency braking. This uses a radar and cameras to monitor the road in front of the vehicle, looking for potential hazards. If an object or hazard is detected, then firstly, the vehicle will warn the driver that that hazard is seen. If the driver fails to react to that hazard, then the vehicle will take control, applying brakes or reducing throttle input to slow the vehicle eventually to a stop, avoiding the incident. The type of objects that the vehicle system is tuned to detect are other road users, either cars, pedestrians, or cyclists. And the systems are tuned to a very high level to detect these different objects in a variety of different use cases, including obscured pedestrians walking out from the road edge, moving traffic and junctions where we will have cut across paths from other vehicles and other road users. 
car makers tend to refer to these systems using their own brand names rather than the generic term of AEB. So we can see that Volkswagen referred to this as front assist with city emergency braking. Volvo referred to as city braking and Nissan intelligent emergency braking. We see many other brand names for these type of technologies that major vehicle manufacturers are using. Lane Keep Assist is again a combination of multiple features providing a limited amount of control of the vehicle. Lane Departure Warning is the first, uh, the first of these two features that monitors the position of the vehicle in the lane, provides an audible warning to the driver to warn them that they are approaching the lane edge. Lane Keeping then takes this warning and takes it as a sensory input into the control system that applies a steering input to center the vehicle in the lane. The steering input could either be using the steering rack, applying a steering torque to move the front wheels and realign the vehicle, or it could use differential braking, applying a brake pressure to one side of the vehicle to pull the vehicle back into position. These systems are becoming more commonplace and provide a very high level of safety because they prevent the vehicle from wandering into alternative lanes where there could be hazards, other vehicles or pedestrians. Typically, these systems work at highway speeds rather than at city speeds due to the increased levels of lane markings that you see on high speed roads and due to the increased complexity that you see in the lane markings in the city environments. Again, the automakers have their own brand names that they apply to these different systems. Finally, adaptive cruise control. Cruise control has been a system that has been fitted to vehicles for many years. The automation of this system is a logical evolution of systems that are traditionally fitted to vehicles. So ACC is a method of speed control. It includes a long range radar, typically 77 gigahertz radar, that is used to monitor the road in front of the vehicle, detecting other vehicles and maintaining a constant gap, a safe operating distance at highway speeds. The operating range of these radars is typically 2 meters to around 120 meters, showing that these systems are really only applicable at higher speed applications. Low speed city traffic gaps can be much less than 2 meters, so therefore it wouldn't prove to be safe to operate them within the city. We are seeing some automakers that are starting to deploy full speed ACC that do allow low speed city driving and also will allow full control from stationary up to cruising speed on the highway as a highway autopilot system. The major safety benefit of ACC is that it maintains a safe gap between your vehicle and the vehicle in front, allowing you to safely decelerate if there's a braking event that occurs in front of you. So these systems are commonplace on many vehicles now. What's going to come next? We've already mentioned the combination of these features into higher levels of automation. The next few slides will give a brief overview of some of the things that are taking place at the moment on the market to develop these higher levels of autonomy. We're starting to see many automakers become active in this field with some of the leaders promoting high levels of autonomy on their current vehicles with combination of many features into highway autopilot, smart summoning features and parking features. These are becoming more publicly visible with automakers investing in startup companies and also startup companies starting to provide systems into the automakers. We're also seeing completely new entrants to the automotive industry starting to develop vehicles that are only interested in high levels of automation, completely bypassing the development of ADAS systems. And we're starting to see the new use cases come up. Mobility as a service providers and the rideshare companies becoming highly active in this field with some of the technology providers making very bold statements as well, such as there'll be hundreds of self-driving cars on the road in five years. This does present a high level of challenge for the industry to make sure that these different systems will be safe and functionally secure. To illustrate this challenge, the following graph shows the level of complexity of a modern high-end car. Be aware this is a modern high-end car, a car currently on the market now. This shows the number of lines of software code that are typically seen in a car, around 100 million lines of code. It's compared to some very well-known, highly technologically advanced systems such as airliners, Mars rovers, space telescopes, fighter jets, space shuttles. And you can see the level of complexity in a modern car is very, very high, showing that the potential for failure of an onboard system is potentially high in comparison to these other highly safety critical items. 
We're only going to see an increase to this complexity as more complex vehicle systems are developed, meaning we must have a robust approach to the validation and verification of these onboard systems. We must ensure that safety is the heart of this to make sure that there are no failures that take place within the systems and to make sure that users of vehicles are protected from any possible danger. So in order to do this, we need to consider three key things. The first of which, as mentioned, is safety. We must ensure acceptable levels of safety are validated for throughout the development of a vehicle. We'll no longer simply be developing a vehicle to pass a test. We'll be developing a vehicle to ensure safety throughout its operating life at all edge cases of its possible operation. We must make sure vehicles are secure. As vehicles become increasingly connected, the opportunity for cyber attack increases. We must make sure that this is not something that will become a problem. Vehicles must be protected and secure against this. And finally, we must make sure that the functions are performing in the way that they are designed. We must ensure that an acceptable level of performance is met while still maintaining high levels of safety and security. Combining these all together will provide a new approach to validation of connected autonomous vehicle systems that differs from traditional automotive development. We must make sure that we use legally sustainable processes throughout the development of a vehicle, expecting to see high levels of interrogation of the development process, not just final sign-off tests when it comes to ensure that our vehicles are safe and operate correctly. This will be the major change that we see over the coming years. The technology is already being developed. What we now need to understand is exactly how that technology is going to be verified to ensure that it meets the safety, security, and functionality requirements for the future. Many thanks for listening to this presentation. Hopefully it's given some insight into where the automotive industry is now and where it's developing in the future. Many thanks. No my hearty my everyone. Thank you for listening and, and uh, coming along to the webinar today. It's great to have you on board. And what um, I'm going to talk about today is really emerging technologies and the, the challenges that lie ahead of us um, with mobility, because it certainly is changing. So let's um, jump into the next slide and have a look. And just to start off and, and give you a bit of a overview of our business, we originally started as a vehicle leasing and fleet management business in 2014 and we saw an, op an opportunity to optimize fleets because we put GPS, um, GPS in every single vehicle that we leased or managed and, and what that told us was that we were leasing and managing all of these vehicles but they were sitting stationary in car parks for so, so um, much of the day. And if you look at those stats on the screen there, when you think New Zealand has $30 billion invested in vehicles um, in New Zealand. And, and if you think of vehicles, they're depreciating assets. And when 95% of the time they're sitting idle and not being used, we thought there was an opportunity to look at is there a way that we could um, utilize those in a clever way with a shared platform. And, and hence, uh, we launched uh, Yugo Share last year. And uh, we are the first. Uh, zero emission car sharing um, platform in the Southern Hemisphere. We thought it would be a really easy thing to, to launch uh, a pure electric car sharing business. Uh, and there's certainly um, and there's been some um, challenges to overcome and it's been really exciting coming in first into Christchurch. And you'll see that photo there of, of um, Jacinda, our Prime Minister, and Leanne Dalzell, our Mayor. And the Council were really um, revolutionary um, looking at mobility and their business and they helped us um, launch and they made a commitment to exit 55 vehicles from their fleet and uh, it was um, compulsory basically for the council staff to use the shared fleet of electric vehicles. The business has grown since February last year and we have over 2,000 bookings a month. We've got over 50 business customers and over 4,000 um, private users as well and that use the vehicles and as Caroline mentioned we've saved over 230 tonnes of carbon which is um, really exciting for the city and if we look at a different country and, and look what's going on there with mobility and in particular electric vehicles 
I know everyone talks about um, Norway, and we often reflect on the stats in Norway, which is very impressive. But if we look at um, a country like China, they've had uh, subsidies in China, which has really boosted the electric vehicle um, manufacturing, and we've seen new manufacturers emerge. Um, Warren Buffett has invested in BYD, and, and we're seeing a whole lot of new Chinese manufacturers um, coming on board with EVs. And if you look at um, 175% increase um, in January and February um, from last year in EV sales, which is quite dramatic. And in New Zealand, we have less than um, 2% of our fleet as EVs. And over there, they have um, 4.2%. So it's a huge amount of EVs, and in particular, they've had a real strength around EV buses. So cities like Shenzhen, their total bus fleet of over 6, 16,000 buses is uh, all EV. So it's certainly impressive um, to see other countries um, leading the way with electric vehicles. And if we look at um, some of the international commitments that we're seeing, um, all of these countries listed here have made a commitment to ban the sale of new combustion passenger vehicles. And the majority of them are making that commitment by 2030. So you can see that mobility is really changing um, globally. And how we own and drive cars um, now isn't, um, isn't going to be this way in 10 to 20 years, which John's already um, mentioned in the previous uh, webinar. We haven't. Um, you'll notice that we haven't got New Zealand on 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 this list yet. But certainly last week, with New Zealand um, passing the zero emission bill, um, that is certainly a, a great stepping stone. And in time, I'm sure you will see us um, step onto this board and make a commitment internationally. Now, the reason why these businesses and the reason why these countries are making commitments. Uh, to electric vehicles and um, zero emission vehicles is really related to um, to air quality. And I know when we um, talk about fleet safety, we often reflect on ANCAP ratings and we often reflect on driver behaviour, which is absolutely the right thing to do. But certainly um, these countries and the businesses that have, and individuals that are, are using our service a big driver for them is air quality. And this uh, slide here is taken from a uh, Auckland Council air quality report and just uh, demonstrates the uh, side effects of internal combustion engines, so that's your petrol and, and your diesel um, vehicles, uh, with black carbon in the cities. And um, certainly uh, in Auckland, there's definitely some room for improvement. And, and something that isn't talked about is the amount of deaths that we see in New Zealand. It's over a thousand Kiwis die a year from air pollution related diseases. And in Europe, it's over 400,000. And in, in China, it's over a million. And, you know, recently there's been um, a lot of global media around the air quality in India and the air quality in China. And hence, you've seen a commitment from India to ban have uh, a new sale of combustion engines by 2040 as well. So, um, you know, 66% of the black carbon measured, if we look at um, Queen Street in Auckland, is from diesel vehicles. And it's at the worst level ever recorded um, this year. So certainly there's an opportunity uh, for us to um, think about health and safety and, and what the impact of our, of our large fleets that we have are making to air quality. And if we look at the carbon savings and the opportunity here, we've got 18% um, of our transport is, is, um, is creating um, emissions. And the great opportunity for New Zealand with 86% of our um, energy is coming from renewable sources. So it really makes sense for us uh, to have electric vehicles. We've seen um, Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch have all declared climate emergencies. And as I mentioned before, the zero emission bill has just 
passed and and we do expect that that will accelerate change which is exciting and as Caroline mentioned at the beginning of the webinar too you know 230 tonnes of carbon has been saved in Christchurch just by people choosing to drive our electric vehicles and, instead of driving a combustion vehicle which is um, a great stepping stone whilst EVs are still in their infancy, they are really starting to take off in New Zealand, which is very positive. But let's have a look now at another zero emission vehicle, which we're seeing emerge in New Zealand, which is exciting. Uh, we've just seen um, Hyundai um, with the launch of their Nexo um, hydrogen vehicle, and that um, is very exciting to see. And we're also seeing some other manufacturers um, start their production of hydrogen vehicles. And certainly um, hydrogen really makes sense for the heavy uh, transport industry where um, battery technology, the batteries are quite heavy and it's a, a great opportunity uh, and we will see the emergence of um, hydrogen into heavy transport. The other exciting thing for New Zealand, um, next year we'll see our first um, green hydrogen station um, going live and that also has an export opportunity uh, for, for New Zealand, which is exciting as well. And um, if we look at hydrogen safety, because uh, hydrogen uh, petrol station was certainly um, in the news this year in Norway when it exploded, it gave some great conversation for Mike Hosking to talk about. Uh, but it's important to that um, we stay balanced on these um, sort of emerging technologies. And um, whilst it did create a lot of uh, stories in the media, uh, when the station exploded, you know, you'll see on the slide that uh, petrol stations um, combusting are um, just, uh, you know, they're just as common as not. Um, more common um, than hydrogen stations. So with all technologies, we are going to see a, a risk. We, and if you look at the studies, you'll see between PHEVs, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, the, the ICE vehicles, so your petrols and your diesels, your hydrogen and, and your pure electric vehicles, they all have a risk around um, combustion. So it doesn't matter which vehicle you choose, that is going to be a risk. And, and this slide here just shows the huge amount of work that goes in by the car manufacturers to create uh, safe vehicles. So um, whilst there'll be a risk with any, um, with any vehicle you choose to drive, um, certainly uh, everything has, is done by the the manufacturers of hydrogen and EV, and, and certainly all of our vehicles are NCAT 5 to minimise the risk uh, as well. And that's really what this slide um, starts to talk about, is all the technology features that we see in today's cars to make them exceptionally safe. And, you know, whilst we have all of this amazing technology um, sitting in the vehicles, for New Zealand it's still very sad to see that we've got the fifth highest fatality rate per capita in OECD countries. So whilst we have got um, very safe cars um, when you're choosing to buy, buy a new car or, or share a new car, as the case may be, we're still seeing high rates. And, and that's certainly an opportunity that New Zealand can improve on. And I know it'll be interesting to see um, autonomous vehicles as they emerge in globally and, and into New Zealand because, you know, as this slide says, if, you know, autonomous vehicles do for transport what flight management systems have done for air travel, we would expect to see a 99% reduction in accidents. So that's really profound and could make a huge impact um, for New Zealand. And we're seeing, um, obviously, our business has started in Christchurch, and it's wonderful to see Omeo um, at Christchurch Airport, um, the autonomous shuttle that's been um, trialled there. And certainly, you know, as we, um, as the decades go on, we will see autonomous vehicles. And we have to ask ourselves, will we actually own vehicles? Will we choose to own vehicles, you know, when they are autonomous? And 
and certainly um, Hugo Shear see see ourselves as a as the gateway drug uh, to autonomy um, because mobility certainly is is changing. And if you're anything like me, I, I I think I am a bit of a control freak because when I have got um, behind the the wheel of a Tesla and and tried the autonomy functions, you know, I have found it very challenging. And I think a lot of Kiwis, um, you know, we we like to hold on to the steering wheel and, and um, we enjoy driving on our roads. So, you know, autonomy is coming, but it's it's going to be an evolution. And if you think of emerging technologies, whether it's the internet, whether it's fax machines, you know, those changes haven't happened overnight. They actually happen um, over 10 years. So, um, we don't need to panic. Um, change will come, but it will it will um, happen slowly. And and we're seeing with the levels of autonomy um, changing in New Zealand. It, you know, it's happening over years, not not overnight. So we need to keep calm and carry on. So thank you for your time. And my contact details are there if you require any further information. Thanks and enjoy your day. Good day everyone, my name is Jonathan Bates and I'm a director at Mixed Telematics. We are a global company with over 766,000 subscribers and we are experts in providing technology for safe and healthy mobility, which is the subject of today's webinar. The agenda today is centred around that technology However, what I'm going to do is associate that to particular people who use the technology. It's really important to try and visualize exactly who and how this technology will be used by. So we will start with the driver before we come on to the more back office analytics and how that can help with the subject. So starting in the vehicle itself, one of the really significant developments in technology that has really evolved steadily over the last 10 years is what we call the in-cab display. And the purpose of this device is to proactively coach drivers in a live environment. There are many retrospective driver training tools and courses, but these can be complemented superbly by having something that actually intercedes in the moment itself. And the way this device works is it's unobtrusive, it does not distract the driver and it's designed very much to become a working part of what they have to do. And it will show when a certain safety behavior event, which you can set up as a business, is triggered. And you can see there on the left-hand side that there's an example of that type of event. And what we can see is there's also a severity measure. The way that we, from our own consultancy experience of working with so many different clients worldwide, what we do is actually advise and set up different thresholds and bandings of safety related events. So we can tell when something is a super harsh incident of an event versus something that is borderline towards harsh. And what that does is when it's kind of that borderline status, it will show an amber colored event and when it's a really harsh event, it will show red. The red ones actually then formulate part of the driver scoring mechanism, which we'll come on to shortly. The amber ones are advisory and they are really there to help coach the driver that they're getting very much on the cusp of having a negative safety behavior event recorded as part of their driver score. So they should certainly start to recede from that kind of behavior. And what we found is by using this type of technology consistently throughout a fleet, combined with good driver training program, we can see that the number of those events goes down over time through this proactive coaching. This technology has also now evolved into really a next generation status where we're also able to look at preventative maintenance events at the same time. And one of the many benefits of this is that there is if there is a particular type of event such as high engine temperature, which is the example you can see on the right hand side of the screen now, if that is flagged up as a company, you can actually put a workflow in there to tell the driver to pull over, switch off the engine and safely contact the back office when those really urgent events take place. This is really important because it help protects, helps to protect both the driver 
and also the vehicle from having a maintenance requirement that is actually going to cause more problem and, and is more unsafe than by taking action in the moment itself. So a combination of that real-time safety feedback and maintenance alerts is there all in that technology along with being able to use RFID to identify the driver. So that's the first element. Then that works completely in harmony and unison with the driver performance app. And this is really allowing drivers to take a very personalized approach to driver training. The driver score, which I mentioned before, is aggregated and is completely available only to that driver on their app themselves on the smartphone. Some organizations like to use gamification, such as ranking and leaderboards, to help incentivize healthy competition between drivers. And some organizations prefer not to have that leaderboard. But what this mechanism does is it allows each driver to see not only their trend information over time, where hopefully they're decreasing their harsh events, but it also allows them to benchmark themselves against the anonymized pool of their own peers. So that could be a particular depot or it could be the whole organization. So they can see their own individual score versus the average score for whatever pool the organization wants. They're also able to go back and look at when and where those events occurred in the mapping, which you can see there in the events graphic. And you're also able to look at that by different vehicles utilized along with fuel consumption. So the driver really uses that information to understand and identify the areas for improvement. So when you put that together with the in-cab display that's actively coaching this driver app and an appropriate driver incentive program, it's really a winning move for fleet operators to have a holistic approach to improving driver performance. And the results speak for themselves. We can see that people that have combined all of those technologies successfully have seen a huge reduction in harsh events, um, such as 66% in reduction in overspeeding events and an 84% improvement in the overall RAG score, which is the driver safety score. There are many financial consequential benefits for this as well, such as fuel savings, but the real focus here is that reduction in those harsh events that ends up resulting in fewer accidents and saving more lives. Another tool that we can see is becoming more and more prevalent within the fleet industry worldwide is in-cab cameras. And we can really see through the evolution with many of the clients that we work with that this is becoming a more and more vital safety training tool rather than a nice to have. And again, what this does if you combine that with the in-cab display that is actively coaching drivers, this is providing real contextual visual evidence for post-driving analysis together with a driver trainer. And this is fantastic because it provides a real objective view of the context behind a particular event. So rather than just looking at a spreadsheet and seeing a number and a threshold rating for a particular event, you can actually see a full picture of what happened and what the context was. And so it could be that the, the driver was distracted or it could be that something occurred in the environment around the driver on the road that actually resulted in them needing to brake harshly. So this gives that real visual evidence element. It can also be used to deter things like unsafe behaviors like cell phone usage. And also with using things like live streaming tools now, it can be used by organizations to do a ride along with a driver so that fleet managers can really start to live in their driver's shoes and understand the challenges that those people face every single day. And again, it's all about results when it comes to this rather than just merely looking at some flashy technology. But we do know that these types of in-cab cameras do result in some drastic safety improvements and incident reduction. We can see, for example, the evidence that for some clients, this has resulted in a 60% reduction in accident and claim liability, but more importantly, a 54% improvement in safe driving. 
and there are many organizations now over the world that are repeatedly investing more and more in this type of technology because they're really seeing the safety benefits um, that are there sustainably over the long term. So away from in the cab itself and now into what I call the back office analytics. So it's very important to have a reasonable benchmark to understand what we really mean by training improvements. And the typical way this is done is to understand from driver behavior reports which drivers need the most attention and also in which particular types of events. So we find that a, a basic mechanism here of color coding those safety behaviors and driver scores and understanding which ones to focus on is the best way forward. And if we look in detail at how these scoring mechanisms work, uh, many organizations and telematics providers will have different variations of this, but essentially the concept is, is pretty much 100% the same. There are different safety behaviors that make up an overall driver score, and that algorithm together will assign uh, weighting to each of those different behaviors, produce an overall score, and then benchmark that over a, the same amount of distance per driver to give a, a score that is, is reasonable and fair to compare like for like. Um, and the idea here is, of course, that with the, the red drivers that have a large score, those drivers require pretty urgent improvement. The amber drivers have a mid-table score, and those drivers do have room for improvement, and it'll be about focusing on specific types of events. And then the green drivers have an excellent score. And what we want to do, obviously, as, as responsible organizations is try to migrate drivers from red and amber into that green. And we can see over time that that, that takes a lot of effort, but these types of technologies and solutions really help give uh, a tangible way of achieving that over a shorter period of time than it would otherwise take. More advanced safety analytics are also coming into play further in the market. Um, one of those areas that is um, really a hot topic is using heat mapping to understand and plot the severity of different types of unsafe behaviors on the map. So this is really useful for organizations that follow very similar routes, um, so for transport, but also for people like bus operators, it can be important to understand where the concentrations of really unsafe behaviors actually occur from a geographic perspective. And then potentially those routes can be adjusted accordingly if there are really unsafe concentrations. Uh, so on the graphic now, you can see a a really worrying outcrop of red there on the road that's towards the center of the screen. And as an organization, you'd be looking to understand, is it essential to take that route? Can a different route be sought out? Why is that route particularly dangerous? Um, and heat mapping is a, a really great way to visualize and make some quick wins. So that's a really whistle-stop tour of the different technology. Obviously, there's lots of technical detail and different examples of particular clients that use that. And of course, we're always available to, to make that information available to you directly. But in the meantime, let's look at a few of the results. Let's just zoom out from the technology and look at the overall results. This customer, for example, really achieved highly managing to acquire a 70% reduction in incidents, which is, is really quite exceptional. Typically, the range that we see with this type of technology can be anything from 30 to 70%. So this is really the top, the top range of incident reduction. And of course, with driving more safely, come the benefits such as fuel efficiency improvements and wear and tear reduction. So there's a huge cost benefit to adopting this technology, which goes together and dovetails with the safety benefits. In this second instance, what we really need before we start looking at incident reduction is to understand the behaviors that lead to that. And that's why I've chosen this case study to share with you, because this focuses on three of the typical behaviors that it's important to reduce in order to achieve those overall safety improvements. And what we can see with the results that's on screen now is by combining those things all together, the customer 
there is able to achieve 95% target in every single depot across the board. So by focusing on each driver's weaker points, by focusing on those individual events, tailoring that driver training program as a result of having full visibility and, in, and intelligence from the technology, operators are able to achieve those benefits across the board and really importantly, sustain it over time. Last but not least, this customer again is another example of one that has been able to decrease harsh acceleration, harsh braking and harsh cornering. And all of those events together have allowed this organization to win a whole number of awards related to their deployment of this type of safety technology. And of course, as well, that decrease in fuel expenditure is again sustainably achieved by using this type of technology. So I hope that that session has been informative for you and giving you a guide to four of the key areas of technology that can really help improve safety. And I look forward to any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks very much for joining this uh, webinar. And thanks to Break for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Nick Reed, and I was head of connected and automated vehicle research at TRL, the UK's transport research laboratory, and then head of mobility R&D at Bosch, the world's largest automotive supplier. I've worked on automated vehicles for more than 10 years and led the government funded gateway project that trialed a range of different automated vehicles in Greenwich, including driverless shuttles, delivery vehicles and remotely operated self-driving cars, all with real people in public environments. I now work as an independent freelance researcher on topics related to the future of mobility. I'm going to talk about the realities of automated vehicles, but first let's start with the vision. For several years now, driverless cars have been a hot topic in the transport world. Whilst there are isolated examples of driverless cars that predated it, the trigger seems to have been the emergence of the Google self-driving car project back in 2010. Since then, there have been many exciting promises made for self-driving cars, and not just for the automation technology itself, but also the dramatic transformations in road safety, congestion, and even societal change that such vehicles may bring. The promised safety improvements stem from the statistics identifying that human error is a contributory factor in more than 90% of road collisions. Automating the driving task may address this issue, an automated vehicle will not drive when tired, drunk or distracted or at inappropriate speeds, all of which remain frequent causes of crashes today. Congestion may be reduced by allowing vehicles to run more closely together and by having greater control over who is traveling and when. Potential societal benefits include lower emissions, cheaper travel and in particular, providing new options for those with additional mobility needs, such as the elderly and the disabled, all very laudable aims. So that's the vision, but what's the reality? The first point to make, and let me be clear about this, is that there are no self-driving cars on the market today. There are vehicles available that can manage speed, lane guidance, even lane changing. There are vehicles that can complete safe parking maneuvers without input. These are all driver assistance systems, which require a human driver to take responsibility for operation of the vehicle. They are not self-driving cars. So where are we today on the idea of cars that can truly drive for themselves? Well, the image on the screen shows the hype cycle from the research company Gartner. This tracks the maturity of emerging technologies over time, starting from an initial spark of innovation, where there is limited awareness of a new technology, through a peak of inflated expectations when everyone gets overexcited about the potential of that technology. After getting drunk on all that visionary excitement, comes the real world hangover, otherwise known as the trough of disillusionment, when we realize all the regulatory, technical and societal constraints that will hamper our progress towards the original vision. As those concerns are gradually addressed, we ascend the slope of enlightenment, heading towards the plane of productivity as the technology becomes an established part of industry or society. Superimposing where automated vehicles have tracked on the hype cycle over time, it is well acknowledged now that they have gone past the peak of hype. No longer do we see uncritical, starry-eyed visions of the future in the media, where driverless cars have solved all our problems of safety, congestion, air quality, and access to mobility. 
More likely now is that we see stories of unexpected safety issues involving driverless cars, dire warnings about congestion caused by cheap access to automated vehicles, or manufacturers rolling back on previously bold claims about what they will deliver by an overambitious deadline. Increasingly and importantly, there is recognition that simply shifting to electric vehicles or automated vehicles will not enable us to meet our environmental targets. This will require more fundamental shifts in our use of vehicles. Perhaps the most negative coverage has been associated with the tragic deaths of Elaine Hertzberg in 2018 and Joshua Brown in 2016. Hertzberg was pushing her bike across a highway when she was hit by an Uber test vehicle that was operating in automated mode as part of development trials of its control systems. Joshua Brown was killed on a dual carriageway when his Tesla in autopilot mode crashed into the trailer of an articulated lorry that was pulling across traffic. Whilst of course these collisions are terrible, it is unfair solely to blame the automation systems for the collision. In each case, the driver on board had ultimate responsibility for safe operation of the vehicle. For the Uber crash, the express task of the safety driver on board was to monitor the driving situation and respond appropriately in any situation where the car was not behaving correctly. She happened to be distracted at the time, watching TV on her smartphone, and made no effort to control the vehicle in time to avoid the collision. For the Tesla, all the user instructions state very clearly that the driver must remain alert and attentive at all times. In this case, the driver appeared to make no response to multiple warnings to take control of the vehicle before the crash happened. However, I think these crashes do raise an important point about automated vehicles. Many experts will open presentations about how self-driving cars can solve 90% of collisions that have driver error as a contributory factor, and I absolutely agree that they can play a huge role in this, but would also counter that although automation might remove driver error, it doesn't remove human error completely. There is still the potential for people to misuse automation systems or for programming errors to creep into computer code, each with potentially fatal consequences. While progress up the slope of enlightenment for self-driving cars may be slower than had been anticipated, we are learning where the systems that underpin this technology can make the biggest contribution to road safety and where they make the most commercial sense. What does that mean in the shorter term? Well, the rush to deliver vehicle automation is having a huge impact on the rate of progress for driver assistance systems and on the economies of scale for the technologies that enable self-driving cars, meaning that advanced safety systems will become increasingly prevalent, not just on luxury vehicles, but also on more everyday cars. On the slide, you can see a list of the advanced driver assistance systems that are available on cars that are in fleets today. In a strange way, I also believe that climate change will support the move towards automated driving. The NCAP star ratings have been a huge success in delivering vehicles that protect vehicle occupants and reduce the harm to third parties in the event of a collision. Some of this success can be attributed to making vehicles that are stronger and therefore offer more protection in the event of a crash. However, this strength comes with something of a weight penalty. With the drive for greater fuel efficiency and electric powertrains in pursuit of our environmental goals, manufacturers are very conscious of anything that adds further weight to the vehicle with diminishing returns in terms of occupant protection. The next quantum leap in safety may come from building self-driving vehicles that can't crash rather than ever stronger, ever heavier vehicles that offer more protection in the event of a collision. But a car that can safely complete common road journeys without supervision remains many years away. The challenge for road safety in the meantime is the mismatch between perceptions of vehicle capability and the reality of what is truly achievable. Because a car that feels like it does the right thing most of the time doesn't mean that it always will. But as a highly intuitive species, our brains make those connections very quickly. And we can therefore be easily tempted by other distractions and, as discussed, I think there is good evidence to say that this phenomenon was a key factor in the fatal crashes that resulted in the deaths of Elaine Hertzberg and Joshua Brown. So to conclude, there is huge potential for vehicle automation to bring genuinely life-saving technologies in the short and long term, but a note of caution. Until we see fully validated and certified automated vehicles where the vehicle manufacturers have accepted liability in the event of a collision. 
There can be no let up in the need for drivers to be fully alert and attentive at the wheel, despite the many temptations and distractions competing for their attention and the many pressures that we face from day to day. Thanks very much for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. I'll now hand back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. We've now come to the end of our formal presentations. Unfortunately, our speakers are unavailable to join us for today's live Q&A. However, please do send through any questions you may have to globalfleetchampions at break.org.uk, or you can join our Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn group to discuss today's webinar with the other delegates. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar, sponsored by Mixed Telematics. We hope you enjoyed it and that the webinar has equipped you with the useful information that will help you to work towards our common goal of safe and healthy mobility in fleets. To view our upcoming events, please visit globalfleetchampions.org and our 2020 programme will be announced shortly. We welcome your feedback, so please do complete our short feedback form, which will appear on your screen once the webinar ends. Thank you to today's presenters and of course our sponsor Mix Telematics. We hope you can join us again very soon. Thank you very much.